the Order, NDIA. Senator Seward, it being 2 p.m., you'll be in continuation. We'll move to questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Was the IMF wrong to downgrade its forecast for Australia's economic growth by four times as much as advanced economies as a whole? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, it's not up to the government uh, to uh, comment. Obviously, the IMF uh, makes its judgment based on uh, what uh, their assessment is of. Uh, global economic trends and pressures on the global economy. Obviously, they've made a judgment that, based on global trade tensions and geopolitical issues that everybody knows about, uh, that, uh, that a further downgrade in global growth was uh, warranted, and they've made some judgments on flow and consequences from, uh, on various uh, countries around the world. Australia is a particularly globally exposed, open trading economy. Obviously, what uh, happens uh, in the global economy is particularly relevant to us, and the circumstance that is unique to Australia compared to others is that not only have we had to deal with a significant flood earlier in the year, we also are dealing uh, with the uh, economic impact of a significant drought in large parts of Australia. Now, on our side of politics, we understand this, and we understand that it's important uh, to stick uh, to the plan to build a stronger economy into the future, because that is the best way to ensure that Australians today and into the future have the best possible opportunity uh, to get ahead. And that is, that, is, that is what we're doing. Let me also say that if we had adopted the uh, Labour position that was taken to the last election, the economy today would be weaker. Would be weaker. Uh, unemployment would be higher. Uh, unemployment would be higher. In fact, um, very soon we'll be hearing from Senator Cash about the uh, employment figures today. And of course, what you can see is that under our government, more new jobs are being created. 1.4 million new jobs, more than 1.4 million new jobs since we were first elected. Employment growth at record record. The 2.6 per cent employment growth compared to a 1.5 per cent Order. forecast. Uh, and indeed, uh, the number of Australians in jobs is at a record high. The number of women in jobs at a record high. Workforce participation at a record high. And indeed, wages growth, uh, real wages growth, higher than it was when Labor lost government and above the uh, long term trend. So let me tell you, the economy under the coalition is in a stronger position than it would have been Order. under Labor. Senator that Cormann, is time for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher, a uh, supplementary question. Thank you. I do have a supplementary, Mr. President. There are nearly two million Australians looking for work or looking for more work. Why is the Morrison government failing to heed the advice of the RBA, Governor, the IMF, state and territory governments, charities and business, and refusing to act to boost the Australian economy? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I completely reject the premise of the question. This government is acting to build a stronger economy. We, we delivered a pro-growth budget in April, which included, which included a further $158 billion worth of income tax relief, taking the income tax relief over the next decade uh, to more than $300 billion. That is putting $300 billion back into the pockets of hard-working Australians, which, of course, they are able to spend or invest in the Australian economy as they see fit. As the Governor of the Reserve Bank has made very clear, and we agree with his assessment, the Australian economy is expected to gradually strengthen into the future on the back of lower interest rates, lower taxes, a continued high investment in infrastructure and, indeed, a pick-up in the resources sector. So uh, we, we will continue to stick to the plan. We're not going to go the Labor way, the high-taxing, high-spending, anti-business, socialist agenda way, because we know that your way, your way would have made the Australian economy Order. And the Australian people knew order. so as well. Senator, order. Order. Senator Gallagher's on her feet. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Under the coalition, the unemployment rate in Australia has risen above the OECD average for the first time in nearly two decades. When will the Morrison government finally take action to boost the economy and to protect jobs? Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much. I mean, the chutzpah for the Labor Party to ask that question. I mean, when we came into government, one of the terrible indicators was the rising unemployment rate. I mean, the uh, shadow treasurer and the out outgoing treasurer of the Labor government, Chris Bowen, was uh, so concerned about what they've left behind is that he said, oh, the test for the incoming coalition government is whether they can keep the unemployment rate below 6 per cent and a quarter. 6 per cent and a quarter. And I don't think he would have said that in order to give us an easy key performance indicator. I 
think he thought that that might have been a stretch target uh, to try and keep the unemployment rate below 6 per cent in a quarter. Guess what? It's at 5.2 per cent today and 1.4 million new jobs under our government. Your high taxing agenda, your high spending high taxing agenda would have made the economy weaker, would have pushed the unemployment rate up, which would have caused wages to fall over time. That is, and the Australian people at the election uh, clearly considered the alternative agendas and they knew that they were better off uh, with our plan to build a stronger economy than with your socialist agenda. Order, 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 order. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate about the results of the recent Australian Labor Force figures for the month of September? Senator Cash. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patterson for the question. Uh, but I'm going to have to build on what our, our outstanding finance minister has already outlined for uh, the Senate today, and that is that for the month of September, we yet again saw the Australian economy creating jobs. And colleagues, 36 months now consecutively, because of the policies of the Morrison government, the coalition government, every single month. We have seen the economy create jobs. That has never, ever happened before in Australia's history. We have now seen full-time employment in Australia at record levels. Mr President, we also have a record number of Australians in employment. With the figures for September, we now see almost 13 million Australians, almost 13 million Australians are in employment because of the policies that the coalition government has put in place. We've also seen, though, in the last 12 months in terms of the job creation, over 60 per cent of the jobs that the economy have created, colleagues, have been full-time jobs. Over 60 per cent of the jobs created. And as the Minister for Women is well aware, we also have a record number of women in employment in Australia, including a record number in full-time employment to a record high of over 6,110,000. And since we came to government, we have put in place the policies to ensure that the employers out there, the job creators of the country, they are able to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. Since we were elected to office, we have now, as a government, put in place the policies that have created almost 1.5 million, almost 1.5 million jobs. That is because we understand the benefits of a strong economy. Order, Senator Cash, Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How is the Morrison government delivering stable and certain economic growth and ensuring more Australians are given an opportunity to find a job? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and it is because we have. A plan. We have a plan to continue to ensure that the businesses out there, the job creators in the country, they are able to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. We said to the Australian people that if you elected us on May the 18th, and they did, we would put in place the policies to create an additional 1.25 million jobs over the next five years. And we are putting in place the policies to ensure that the economy is able to do that. We are, of course, returning the budget to surplus 2019-20, something those opposite haven't managed to do since 1989. We're also, though, Mr President, we are delivering record infrastructure investment over $100 billion, because construction, infrastructure investment, it creates jobs. Order. But what are we also doing? $158 billion in tax relief for 9 million hard-working Australians. Senator, Cash. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, I hope the answer to this question is no, but are there any policy risks that you are aware of that could jeopardise these record figures? Order. Senator Cash. Uh, well, the answer, Senator Patterson, is actually yes. And it is, of course, the policies of the Australian Labor Party, policies which were comprehensively rejected by the Australian people on the 18th of May, because the Australian people understood $387 billion in additional taxes being imposed on the economy would see job losses in Australia. The reality is that. Colleagues, as of the 1st of July this year, 
if those opposite had been elected, their retiree tax, their superannuation tax and their tax on family businesses would have taken effect. We were elected as a job-creating government, and Mr President, we will continue to put in place the economic framework and the economic policies to ensure that the businesses out there, because businesses create jobs, are able to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. And again, with today's labour force figures, Order. a record Senator number of Cass, Australians time for in the employment. Expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. After the IMF downgraded Australia's growth outlook for this year by four times more than downgrades for advanced economies as a whole, a Chief Executive of the Australian Industry Group, Mr Innes Willocks, said, and I quote, our economy needs a spark to regain momentum. Mr Willocks called for an acceleration of shovel-ready infrastructure investment and public works and the bringing forward of income tax relief. Is Mr Willocks correct? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. You know what? In this business, there's always a variety of people who have got a variety of views on what should or shouldn't happen. And, and let me say that we have a plan. We work, to, we work to a plan to build a stronger economy, to create more jobs, which includes uh, substantial income tax relief, which, which includes uh, an ambitious infrastructure investment pipeline, a $100 billion uh, infrastructure investment pipeline, which includes uh, an ambitious free trade agenda, which is, of course, designed to help our exporting businesses uh, get more, sell more Australian products and services around the world and create more jobs here uh, in Australia. It includes, of course, our plan to bring the cost of electricity down. Uh, it, it includes our uh, plan uh, to make it easier to do business in Australia, to reduce the cost of doing business through our deregulation agenda. And when it comes to infrastructure, it's a matter of public record that we are prepared to move sooner on those projects that the state and territory governments are able to move sooner on where that makes sense. The Prime Minister some time ago, and that is also a matter of public record, has written to premiers and chief ministers to invite them to work with the Commonwealth to identify those projects that can be delivered sooner. But we will not ever do what the Labor Party did, and that is to uh, recklessly uh, throw money out the door on uh, pink butts uh, into, uh, you know, into houses which then had to be taken out because the roofs were burning. The roofs were burning. Uh, and, and you know what? And the beds were burning too. And, uh, and, we are not, and we're not going to and we're not gonna go and, uh, create and build and spend billions of dollars on school halls that were not required. We are going to invest uh, Australians' taxpayers' money wisely into economy-enhancing, productivity-enhancing infrastructure to build a stronger future. That is our responsibility. That is what we will be doing. Uh, the Labor Party clearly, if they had won the election, would have increased the tax burden on the economy by $387 billion, which would have cost jobs and put families, would have hurt families around Australia. We will stick to our plan. We will not be uh, pushed around by the Labor Party, which has a very bad track record. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. President. After the IMF said that monetary policy cannot be the only game in town, the former Liberal Treasurer, Mr Peter Costello, warned that, and I quote, monetary policy has run its race. Given the Minister's earlier answers, does this mean that Mr Costello is a socialist? Senator Cormann. <laughs> I have to do one thing. No, no, no. The, the, one, the one thing I can absolutely 100% guarantee you is that uh, Mr Order. Costello, a, a giant of Australian politics, uh, the greatest, arguably the greatest treasurer of all time, Order. is not a socialist. And let me tell you, let me tell you what I Senator, also can tell you about Wong. Mr Costello, is that he's opposed to Labor's high-taxing, high-spending agenda. Because Mr Costello, like every Order. single person on this side of the chamber, knows Order. that Labor's agenda would have hurt the economy, would have cost jobs, and indeed would have left every Australian family worse off. We will continue to stick to our plan our sensible balance, and uh, we will continue to stick to our plan to build a stronger economy, to ensure that the Australian economy Order. is as resilient as possible. Uh, just, just, because, just because the Labor Party can't get their socialist agenda up doesn't mean that our plan for lower taxes, more infrastructure, uh, more free trade agreements, lower electricity prices, that that is not a plan that will build the economy, make the economy stronger. Of course it will. Order. There's a little too much noise during that answer. I'll call Senator Watt when, I, when there's silence. On my right, Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Um, I think there's a whole range of people considering their political ideology right now. Uh, the RBA governor, the IMF, state and territory governments, charities and business are all calling for the government to stimulate the economy. When will the government finally take action to boost the Australian economy? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I know that the Labor Party uh, is allergic to tax cuts. But let me tell you something about tax cuts. Tax cuts leave more money in people's pockets. That stimulates the economy. Now, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I say to you again, I mean, because you know, we haven't had any uh, questions recently about wages growth. Let me tell you, effective wages growth under our government uh, is substantially higher than it was under you. you. Substantially higher than it was under you. Because what matters to the Australian people is their take-home pay. And their take-home pay is higher, one, because the real wages growth is higher than it was under Labor, and because we have put more money back into their pockets that they've worked hard for through $300 billion worth of income tax relief. More money in workers' pockets stimulates the economy. And you, and you were against it. You were against it. You went to the last election campaigning for higher taxes on uh, income, on investment, on housing, on energy, on anything that moved. And the Australian people condemned you for it. They voted. They kept you out of government because of it. Order. So, Senator Cormann. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Minister, there's an old political joke in this country that goes something like this. What have all young Liberals got in common? Senator Bernardi? Order. The answer, they were children who never learned to share. In these precarious times, with so many clouds on the horizon, I can understand why you don't find that funny. With so many Australians doing it tough and needing a leg up, wouldn't you agree that now is the time to share the budget surplus with all Australians to directly stimulate the economy, including by raising New Start, increasing the minimum wage, reversing the cuts to penalty rates, removing the cap on public sector wages? And massively increasing infrastructure spending. Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Senator Wish Wilson just has proven that he's never spent time at a Young Liberals meeting because he clearly, he clearly doesn't know what brings Young Liberals together and what brings Liberals around Australia together. That is because we understand, we understand that the best way to ensure Australia today into the future, the best possible opportunity to get ahead, is to support individual freedom, free enterprise, reward for effort, encouraging people to stretch themselves. Because we know that in countries around around the world, uh, policies that are based on an agenda supporting freedom, free enterprise, reward for effort, supporting people and incentivizing people to have a go is the best way to build the strongest possible economy so that individuals, their families and communities have the best possible living standards. That is what brings young Liberals and Liberals around Australia and I'm sure nationals around Australia together. And let me tell you, that is the agenda that the Australian people voted for at the last election because they understood being presented with the socialist agenda of those opposite which wanted to push taxes up, put their hands into people's pockets, uh, put, put their hands into people's pockets. People understood that would have reduced opportunity. We are for more opportunity and more jobs, and that is why we uh, join this great movement that is the Liberal cause. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. Order. In June this year, the Governor of the Reserve Bank, Philip Lowe, said that if the government can build productive capacity by borrowing at low interest rates, it seems like that is a good thing to do. Minister, given that interest rates have never been lower in our country's history, why is your government still obsessed with paying down debt rather than borrowing to build and stimulate the economy and set Australia up for the new century? Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, let me just make uh, this uh, point. We, we are totally focused on making sure that the Australian economy is as strong and as resilient as possible uh, in an uncertain world. We are an open trading economy. We are a globally focused and globally exposed trading economy. And as we have seen in recent times, depending on what happens in the world, that has an impact on our domestic economy. And because of that, we, we actually, as 
as, a, as part of a plan to build a stronger, more resilient economy, one of the very important features of that uh, is to ensure uh, that uh, government lives within its means so that our important uh, funding for uh, welfare services, health, education, national security is on a fiscally sustainable basis. And the reason uh, we are committed to paying down the level of debt uh, is to ensure that we protect future generations uh, from that burden of additional taxes and deeper spending cuts in order to ensure that our balance uh, sheet can withstand uh, future economic shocks that could come our way Order. because of what Senator happens in Cormann, the world. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Ms. Wilson, a final Thank supplementary question. Thank you, President. Speaking of shocks, just yesterday the IMF also called for governments internationally to borrow to build, including to fund infrastructure investment to address climate change. Minister, if we're not yet in an economic emergency, we are in a climate emergency. Why won't you use the government's borrowing capacity to build the clean energy future that would address both the economic woes this country faces as well as the current climate emergency. Senator Cormann. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Firstly, I reject the premise of the question, and let me just say again that those of us on uh, this side of the chamber, Liberal National Party senators, uh, we believe in environmental protection that is economically responsible. We believe in environmental protection that is economically responsible. Uh, as a, as a, as, 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 as far as uh, climate change is concerned, I have said many times in this chamber, we are committed to effective uh, action on climate change. We are committed to effective action on climate change in a way that is economically responsible. And here we have the Leader of the Order. Opposition interject, and this is from Order. a party that does not have a policy on climate change. What is your policy on climate change? What is the Labour Party policy on climate change? I mean, they have got 30 policies on climate change, and nobody knows uh, who's, you know, what the other's policy is. So on this side, again, we have a plan to meet our 2030 emissions reduction target. We will stick to that plan. We will deliver on those targets. You know, we, we, when we came into government, we were running behind our Kyoto 2020 targets. We are now running ahead because of the actions of this government. So don't give Order. us any lectures Senator when Coleman, it comes to time for the reduction. answer has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rushton. At a forum held in Murray Bridge on the 2nd of October, the minister argued against the need for an increase to New Start, saying, and I quote, "All it would do is give drug dealers more money and give pubs more money." The minister claims the reporting is misleading, but the chief executive officer of the National Council for Single Mothers and Their Children, Therese Edwards, who attended the forum, has said, and I quote, "She did say it," labelling the comments as deplorable. Who is telling the truth, Minister? You or Ms Edwards? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, um, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Gallagher, for your question. Can I categorically state in this place that the comments that were reported in the Murray Bridge Standard that were attributed to me were misquoted and misrepresented? Order. Um, but what I would say is one of the Order. issues that we were talking about at that particular forum was in relation to how do we help people who find themselves with significant barriers to employment, how do we help them deal with those barriers? Um, and one of the things that, that was, was specifically being discussed at that time was how people who find themselves in a situation where they have addictions, whether it be drug addictions, alcohol addictions, gambling addictions, about how we can put programs in place to assist those people to be able to deal with those uh, addictions. Um, so clearly, um, you know, those opposite may seek to verbal me, Mr. President. They may seek to verbal me, but I can absolutely assure you um, that it doesn't matter what they say. It will not change the resolve of this government to help Order. people who find themselves without a job and find themselves with significant barriers to employment to help them get past those barriers. Because we are absolutely committed to making sure that any Australian who wants a job will be put into a position where we. Can assist them in getting a job, and there are a myriad of different ways that we are doing that. And those that, those opposite that come in here and seek to trivialise this really, really important issue by making Order. these sorts of statements—it's shame on you, shame on you. But we will remain absolutely focused, absolutely focused on making sure that when we identify that people have barriers to be able to get into work, that we will work with them to address those barriers. The only thing that is disgusting in here is the misrepresentation that you seek to perpetuate. 
Order. I'll call Senator Gallagher for a supplementary question. When there's order. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. One quarter of New Start recipients are over the age of 55, and the number of over 55s on New Start has surged by 45 per cent under this government. What portion of payments to this cohort does this government allege is going to drug dealers and pubs? Senator Rustin. Thank you. I'm very disappointed that you continue to trivialise the fact that some people are actually face significant barriers to getting into employment on the basis of addiction. I can assure you this government does not trivialise that, and we will continue to work with people who find themselves with barriers as a result of addiction. We will keep helping them to overcome those barriers. But can I say thank you very much for the question in relation to older Australians, because this government actually recognises that there are a number of older Australians who find themselves with additional barriers to being able to get into work. And that is why this government is actually focusing and targeting, specifically targeting, uh, measures so that we can assist older Australians to get back into the workforce. In fact, in the 18-19 budget, uh, we introduced a measure called More Choices uh, for a Longer Life package, which actually addresses providing skills and job access ready initiatives to help older Australians who find themselves without a job to be able to be skilled up to get a job so that they can get back into the workforce. Senator Gallagher, final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Given the minister has categorically ruled out saying those words, will the minister now release the transcript or recording? Her office claims exists. Senator Rustin. Order. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I'm Order. Um, there has been a reporting in this particular um, publication subsequently. Not, I, I'm not exactly sure it's exactly what I said, but it does actually. But it does Order. actually. Um, do you actually want Order. to hear what I've got to say or not? Uh, Mr. President, I'm quite uh, Senator happy Rustin, to explain... I've, got Senator, I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Uh, if the minister is correcting her first answer, he should, she should be clear about that. There's, a, there's an opportunity order. There's an opportunity after question time for debate. Ministers have an opportunity during and after question time about their statements. I'll call the minister to continue. I categorically state I am not correcting my first answer. My first answer was absolutely accurate. What I am saying to you is there was a subsequent story in the Murray Valley Standard that actually provided greater clarification around what the uh, journalist actually thought I said. So just be a little bit careful because you're on pretty Order. shaky ground here Senator if you've Watt. got to start talking about what I Order. said and what Senator I didn't Ruskin. say. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. Senator Gallagher has asked whether or not you will the minister will release the recording or transcript her office claims to have. I ask you to remind the minister of that question. Uh, I, and I Quite right. The minister was dealing with so many interjections. I was having trouble hearing her myself. So I will ask those on my left to allow me to hear the minister's answer. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, I'm more than happy to to, um, to direct you to the Murray Valley Standard subsequent article that has a transcript in there. I'm also more than happy to direct those opposite to the comments that I made on Sky TV uh, a couple of weeks ago. But once again, I'd say we are focused on fixing Order. the issue. Order. Time for the answer has expired. Order. Order. Senator Roberts is on his feet. There are question times only halfway through. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for Senator Cormann, representing the Prime Minister. On the 3rd of October 2019, the Prime Minister, during an address to the Lowy Institute, highlighted that quote, unelected international bureaucracies are pushing for a borderless global community that aims to damage our livelihoods, our safety, and our sovereignty. Twenty-five years ago, your state's Order. Liberal Premier, Richard Court, warned of the dangers of unelected international bureaucracies in his book Rebuilding the Federation and specifically named the United Nations. Twenty-three years ago, Pauline Hanson MP called out the UN's 1992 Rio Declaration, Agenda 21. When can we expect the Australian government to remove us from the following damaging treaties, protocols and declarations? The UN's 1975 Lima Declaration, the UN's 1992 Rio Declaration for 21st Century Global Governance, the, the UN's 1996 Order. Kyoto Agreement, and the UN's 2015 Paris Agreement. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Let me just uh, say uh, right up front, uh, I was uh, uh, at the Lowy Institute speech by the Prime Minister. It was a great speech, and I would invite, I would invite all colleagues uh, to read it and to read it in its full context. Uh, and uh, what, I, what I would also say, uh, by way of second point, is that Australia, as you know, the world's 13th largest economy, we do take our international responsibilities very seriously. But that doesn't mean that from time to time we don't express a view about things that could be improved when it comes to the uh, international architecture that we operate in. And from time to time it needs updating. And indeed we have expressed a view uh, in relation to our multilateral trading uh, infrastructure that there are uh, some improvements that could and should be made and, and that is something that we are uh, articulating uh, uh, forcefully uh, at, in the appropriate in the appropriate fora now and you've also you've also Order. mentioned you also mentioned uh, Richard Cord and Senator Smith and I uh, we actually both had the privilege to serve uh, in the uh, office of the uh, outstanding and distinguished former West Australian Premier uh, Richard Court. So that's, uh, you know, that's that yeah, a yeah. very memorable period. Absolutely. Richard Court did a great, did a lot of great things for the great state of Western Australia. So I'm pleased that you're aware of all of the contributions that he's made uh, over, over, over the years. But uh, let me just, let me just, let me just conclude. I would encourage every senator in this chamber and indeed all Australians uh, to read precisely uh, what the Prime Minister has said in his speech uh, at the Lowy Institute. There's a lot of verbal going on, uh, a lot of verbling, in particular by the Labour Party, uh, which, and selective quoting, as uh, Senator Payne uh, quite rightly points out. Uh, we, we are absolutely uh, committed uh, to uh, do the right thing internationally and to take our international responsibilities very seriously indeed. Senator Roberts, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Twenty-five years ago, as I said, Liberal Premier Richard Court warned of the dangers of unelected international bureaucracies in his book Rebuilding the Federation. He said, and I quote, these international agreements are made primarily by people outside Australia. The terms and conditions are set by officials from other countries. While Australia takes part in the negotiations, it does not exercise the dominant influence. The foreign countries do. For the past 25 years, why have Liberal governments ignored this advice? It's time to put Australia first. Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Premier. While I uh, once in, Order. Uh, while I once Senator McAllister. while I once served in the office of uh, former Premier Richard Court, now His Excellency the Australian Ambassador Senator uh, to Watts. Japan, doing an outstanding job, doing an outstanding job uh, there too. Let me just say, I represent the Prime Minister in this chamber, and not a former uh, Premier of uh, the great state of Western Australia. So, uh, you know, I, I note the comments that uh, Senator Roberts uh, has provided, but let me also refer the chamber to my. Uh, initial um, uh, answer, my first answer, and that is uh, that Australia, as a um, middle power, uh, does take its international responsibilities seriously, and we are an active yeah. and constructive participant uh, in all of the relevant uh, international fora, always pursuing Australia's national interest, always pursuing and advancing Australia's national interest, and of course we are uh, represented with distinction by our outstanding Foreign Minister, Senator Payne. Uh, who, who does a great job on our behalf, and uh, you know we are we are represented by fine public Order. servants. Order, Senator Cormann. Time for the, the answer world. has expired. Order, Senator Roberts. Final supplementary Thank question. Thank you, Mr. President. Although the Prime Minister didn't quite have the courage to name the United Nations as the unelected international bureaucracy that he was condemning, when can we expect Australia to have the courage to exit the United Nations and allow Australians through the ballot box? to determine Australia's future rather than unelected, unaccountable, socialist bureaucrats. Order. Order. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. We are a founding member of the United Nations. We will not be uh, leaving the United Nations, but that doesn't mean that we can't strive to improve the operation of international bodies that we are a part of. And you know, any, any organisation made up of human beings is uh, you know, can always be, is always uh, able to be improved. It's not uh, ever flawless. And uh, so I think it's quite appropriate for the Prime Minister to, in a comprehensive foreign policy speech, uh, to assess all of the uh, uh, issues that we believe are important from Australia's national interest point of view. And, and that is indeed what he did. And I commend uh, the Prime Minister's speech uh, to you again, as I did before. Senator Sinodinas. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, my question, Mike, I'll pay you later. Uh, my question is to the Mr. President, is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. 
How does the government's strong economic management assist exporters financially to grow their businesses and create more jobs, especially for our small and medium-sized enterprises? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And can, I, can I thank Senator Sinodinas for his question, which, uh, which I may boldly predict could well be his last question in this place. Uh, and in doing so, thank Senator Sinodinas for his service to the Senate and to our nation and to congratulate him on his valedictory speech last night. It was a valedictory speech that epitomised uh, Senator Sinodinas' uh, depth, substance, wisdom uh, and sense of vision uh, in which he outlined uh, many great policy challenges for our nation and ways in which they should be tackled and demonstrated his policy drive in areas such as space and research cooperation areas that I am confident uh, will stand him in good stead in his next career uh, working for Australia and Australians and their interests and on their behalf uh, with the United States, who is our largest investment market, our largest investment uh, partner uh, and, of course, a key trading partner as well. And it's through agencies such as Austrade and Export Finance Australia uh, that our government, uh, with a strong economy, is able to keep and help Australian exporters to continue succeeding and to export more into the future. Indeed, Austrade provides expertise advice through a network of 117 offices uh, across the globe, helping exporters in all of those cities and markets uh, to be able to succeed. And sellers we are record, vi record value of Australian goods and services into those markets. And Export Finance Australia provides valuable financial expertise and solutions to help businesses grow. Indeed, last year, last financial year, Export Finance Australia completed 147 transactions, providing over $377 million of support in terms of financial service assistance to 107 businesses. But what did that generate and create? Some $2.3 billion worth of export contracts. Export contracts supporting more than 13,600 jobs, and that's what it all comes back to: Senator job Birmingham. opportunities for Australians. Senator Sinodinas, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And it's wonderful there are so many people in the audience to hear Senator Birmingham's great disquisition. What impact have the government's trade policies had on growing the volume and value of Australian exports? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. We have record numbers of Australian businesses who are exporting now. More than 53,000 Australian businesses are engaged in exporting across the globe, including 46,000 small and medium-sized enterprises. That's an increase of more than 18 per cent since our government was elected. 18 per cent more Australian businesses across all sectors of our economy are engaged in export activity. And it's estimated that more than 240,000 trade-related jobs have been created in the last five years. So when we think about the employment strength that Senator Cash and Senator Cormann were speaking of earlier today and the jobs growth in Australia, a huge component of that is because of the growth in our export positions. And that has been supported, yes, by our trade agreements and opening up market access across the Australian economy but also by the direct assistance that we provide as a government to help Australian businesses enter those markets. That's why we've grown so many additional exporters. Senator Sinodinas, a final supplementary question. Mr President, what are the government's further plans to support more businesses to expand and grow through export-related activities across the Pacific region? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, we have many plans to help Australian businesses grow. We strive to see a further 10,000 Australian businesses engaged in export activities. Uh, we want to see and ensure uh, that trade agreements provide market access to more than 90 per cent of Australia's trade, or around 90 per cent of Australia's trade in the future. Uh, our plan is to continue to provide that practical assistance uh, through Export Finance Australia and through Austrade uh, to help those greater numbers of businesses uh, sell more quality Australian farm produce and agricultural produce as we do and to make sure that our farmers are well placed uh, when the drought ends to be able to grow those volumes and the value of those exports. We're going to continue to invest, of course, in supporting all of our traditional sectors as well as the research and modern ones as well. And, of course, in terms of particular plans across uh, the broader Pacific region, well, I'm sure as well that our advocacy in the United States of America uh, will have a great advocate in growing Australian exports and trade into the future, and we Order. wish you well, Arthur.
Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Cash, representing the Minister for Health. Uh, Minister, I want to ask about the report titled Economic and Social Impacts of Recreational Hunting and Shooting, released by the Department of Health in September 2019. Minister, how much of the health budget was spent on this report? Which minister commissioned it? And does the minister believe that this is an appropriate use of the public health budget? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Faruqi, for the question. I have to say I do have a comprehensive brief from the minister, who is doing an outstanding job. But in relation to that incredibly specific question, I will have to take it on notice and revert to you. Senator Faruqi, supplementary question. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Minister, many of the assertions of the report have been rightly ridiculed, such as somehow people who shoot animals have a higher level of well-being than people who don't shoot animals. Does the minister agree, that, agree with that assertion, and is this borne out by any other evidence that you are aware of? And perhaps Minister Mackenzie would like to respond to that question. Senator Cash. Well, thank you very much. And, uh I have to say, thank you, Senator McKenzie, for some information in relation to the question. I do represent the Minister for Health, and I have to say, such a specific question, Senator Faruqi, you actually, if you wanted an answer, are entitled to provide notice, uh, and I, or, or, or ask next week an estimate. So I actually could have, had you provided notice, I could have asked the Minister and brought you a more comprehensive answer. Uh, but in relation to, I'm now informed, Australia's national sports plan, Sports 30. It actually outlines uh, the need for a diverse sport industry with a wide range of activities to support more Australians to be more active. The report actually shows uh, recreational hunting and sport shooting is a regulated activity which engages individuals, clubs and communities across Australia. Recreational hunting and shooting can contribute physical, social, mental health and wellbeing benefits to participants. And the activity has links and pathways to target shooting sports in Australia, uh, which a number of members here participate in, uh, noting the government supports accessibility. Order, to Senator Olympi Cash. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Minister, isn't it true that this research isn't worth the paper that it's written on, and merely an attempt by the shooting lobby to promote itself by taxpayer expense, aided and abetted by Minister Mackenzie? Senator Cash. A very simple response. The answer to the question is no. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister uh, for Families and Social Services, uh, Senator Rustin. Uh, can the Minister confirm that in September, New Start payments were indexed by only 24 cents per day? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, and I, I thank Senator Dodson uh, for his question. Uh, I can confirm that in September, as in March uh, this year, as in every other year, uh, New Start has been indexed the same way, uh, and that is by CPI uh, since uh, uh, for the last 20 years, indexed this way under the government um, that I have been a part of for the last six years, and also the same way and by the same mechanism as it was increased by your government for the years that you were in government. But what I can say is um, that the that New Start um, is a, a, a uh, safety net payment that is provided to people who find themselves uh, without a job. And, and clearly nobody on this side of the chamber, and I'm sure nobody on that side or anywhere in this chamber, uh, would suggest that living without a job would be easy. But the one thing that we are absolutely committed to as a government is to make sure that we don't not only create the jobs, but we create the pathways to the jobs and the barriers to break them down. And um, the, this morning's um, uh, news about the increased um, growth in employment is really good news for Australians who find themselves without a job, because it's by the creation of more jobs that we are able to increase the level of participation of Australians in the workforce, because we know that the health and well-being of Australians is enhanced by them having a job. Um, and by continuing to grow the economy, make sure the economy is strong, is the way that we continue to be able to create jobs, because it is the economy that creates jobs and it is the jobs that the economy creates that are the thing that is an absolutely essential component of us being able to assist people 
off welfare and into a job. But that's not all we're doing. We understand that providing that safety net is not our only responsibility. We have further responsibility to make sure we create pathways to jobs and that we continue to break down the barriers to enable people who currently find themselves without work into Order. work. Senator Dodson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Reserve Bank Governor has said that uh, boosting the rate of New Start would be, and I quote, good for the economy. Why is the Morrison government refusing to do something that's good for Australians and good for the economy? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. The government is absolutely focused on policies, policies that have the most positive impact on the economy, like boosting productivity, creating jobs and, of course, moving people from welfare into a job. But clearly, welfare is not a stimulus. It is designed as a safety net. Uh, the proportion of Australians currently receiving working age income support payments has fallen to its lowest level in 30 years. It's down to 14.3 per cent. But you know, there are 230,000 Australians fewer who are on working age payments than there were in 2014. That's 230,000 families who now have a job to be able to provide the assistance to their families. So, Focusing on the creation of jobs. Order. Focusing on the Order. creation of jobs. We make no apology for creating jobs and getting people into work because we believe that's the best Order, way. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Dodson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Governor of the Reserve Bank, uh, KPMG, the Business Council of Australia, ACOS, Deloitte's Access Economics, the Country Women's Association, and the former Prime Minister, Mr. John Howard has called for the government to increase the rate of new start. Given the minister's, minister famously told pensioners what they received, and I quote, is generous, does the minister also think new start is generous? The minister, minister Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Senator Dodson. And, and I'm sorry that you are trivialising this really important issue, like your other colleague, because I can order. absolutely— Senator assure... Wong, on a point of order. I'd ask the minister to withdraw that. Senator Patrick Dodson is not trivialising this issue. Um, given, look, I, I'm going to leave that in the hands of Senator Rustin. It wasn't unparliamentary. I don't consider it to be a reflection, given the jousting that has been happening and the interjections across the chamber. Um, I leave it in the hands of the senator. I allowed you to make the point, Senator Wong. Um, but I might say some of the interjections have been particularly robust at this question time. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks, Senator Dodson, for his question, because I can absolutely assure this chamber that getting people from welfare into a job is something that this government takes very, very seriously. Um, and it's the creation of those jobs that's important. But can I just say that Australia's comprehensive welfare system recognises that there are times when Australians are down on their luck. And we need to make sure that we have a safety net, not just for this generation, but for future generations, to make sure that we're here to help them in their time of need. And not just when they, they find themselves on tough times, but to make sure that that safety net's in place for as long as they need it. But it has to be sustainable, and we will continue to work on all of the components and all of the elements that are essential for a stronger Order. Australia. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister advise the Senate of any continuing concerns the government has about the consular case of Australian citizen Mr Jock Palfreyman in Bulgaria? Can the Minister advise... Oh, sorry. Apologies. Thank you. Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Henderson for her question. Uh, I would like to note that the Australian government uh, welcomes Jock Paul Freeman's release from the Mansi Detention Centre in Bulgaria early yesterday morning. He is now in the community, and that is a positive step. However, we are concerned that he remains unable to leave Bulgaria due to a travel ban that dates back to 2011. Uh, Mr Paul Freeman and his legal team are challenging that ban, and the Australian government is following that process closely. Uh, also, the Prosecutor General of Bulgaria is seeking a review of the process followed in granting Mr. Paul Freeman's parole. 
While the parole decision itself cannot be appealed, the Prosecutor General is questioning technicalities about the handling of the case. We understand that this is outside Bulgaria's normal legal process, and we would be concerned, Mr. President, if non-legal issues were seen to have an influence on this process. I'm advised that the decision by the court on that matter may take up to two months, which would mean that Mr. Pulfreman continues to face uncertainty until early December. We have called and continue to call for the Bulgarian authorities to allow Mr Palfreyman to travel to Australia given his uh, paroled status. I stress that we respect the independence of the Bulgarian court and wish to see it make a decision according to the rule of law. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Um, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate of what consular assistance the government has provided to Mr Palfreyman? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The government has provided everything required to date to assist Mr. Porfriman to leave Bulgaria as soon as possible, and we will continue to do so. We are in contact with him and will provide every assistance to him as his case moves forward. He has received consular help throughout his case, both before and since the parole decision on the 19th of September. Uh, officials have, of course, monitored his case. They have attended court proceedings and they have made over 100 prison visits uh, in the uh, lengthy time he has been imprisoned to check on his welfare. We've provided additional consular resources uh, to our diplomatic post in Athens, which enables us to have a presence in Sofia, the Bulgarian <coughs> capital, because we do not have a permanent mission uh, there. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline to the Senate what representations the Australian government has made to the Bulgarian government on Mr Poffryman's case? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. We are engaging with Bulgarian immigration authorities to seek clarification about facilitating Mr Poffryman's uh, uh, ability to depart from Bulgaria. Previously, I have uh, also raised our concerns about his case directly with my Bulgarian counterpart, Minister Ekaterina Zakarevia. On the sidelines of the United Nations, I have followed up that uh, conversation and further conveyed our concerns in writing. Uh, I have also raised it uh, with, in writing, Mr. President, with our European Union counterpart, uh, High Representative Federica Mogherini, and to EU Vice President Timmermans about Mr. Paul Freeman's case, stressing our concern about his prolonged immigration detention following the parole decision. Uh, in addition, of course, our uh, officials continue to raise our concerns with senior Bulgarian officials uh, and authorities and the relevant ministers in Bulgaria, and we seek due process to be applied to Mr. Paul Freeman's matter and to enable him to travel to Australia. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In an article in this morning's Australian entitled, It's Brian Houston and the Prime Minister Does Have a Problem, Nikki Sava says, and I quote, taxpayers and voters have every right to know who was there or not and why, and the media has a duty to ask. It's not just gossip and it's everybody's business, not just the Prime Minister's. Why has the Prime Minister repeatedly refused to deny reports that he sought to have Brian Houston invited to the White House? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. I note that Senator Keneally has read the Australian uh, this morning. It's good to know that the Murdoch press uh, is uh, now getting fiver with Senator Keneally. Uh, let me just say that I've got nothing to add to the Prime Minister's statement on the topic. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. In question time on Monday, Order. In question time on Monday, the Prime Minister again refused to say whether or not he sought to have Brian Houston invited to the White House. Did the Prime Minister or his office seek to have Brian Houston invited to the White House, yes or no? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, Mr. President. I refer Senator Keneally to my uh, primary answer. Yeah. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Oh, what are you hiding? Order. Who else? What is he hiding? My supplementary question. Order. Senator Keneally. Let's try it this way. Why? Did the Prime Minister seek to have Brian Houston invited to the White House? Yes. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I don't have anything to add to my previous uh, two answers. <laughs> Senator McGrath. Order. Order. Senator McGrath. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. 
My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Canavan. How is the Liberal National Government delivering stable and certain water supply for farmers across the country, and how does this contrast with the approach taken by the Queensland Labor Government? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator McGrath for his question. He's a big fan, I know, of dams. We all on this side love dams. We love building dams. Their dams are good for Australia. They're good for our country because dams help us protect and plan for our futures. Our dam is all about storing water today so in the future we can grow more food, more wealth, create more jobs Order. and more opportunity for all Australians. Order. That's why we love Order. dams. Please, I'm going to ask Senator Canavan to resume his seat. We're nearly there, everyone. Six minutes to go. Can we at least have it so that I can hear the minister's response, even with his voice I was struggling to then? Senator Canavan, you're free to continue. Well, Mr. President, I can well understand why this chamber is so excited about <laughs> dams. <laughs> Everybody loves, loves dams. And, Mr. President, people are even more excited this week because on the weekend, uh, the government, uh, the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, announced additional funding, additional investment for more dams in Australia. They announced $567 million of more funding for dams in New South Wales. We can all see the terrible drought that's occurring uh, in regional New South Wales right now, and these investments give farmers hope for the future, that we will have, uh, have water, we will have investment, we will have an expanded agricultural sector that the Minister of Agriculture is working so hard to provide. So, Mr President, we will be investing in the, the Wyangala Dam, upgrading uh, uh, that uh, 10 metre rise on the Wyangala Dam, and also investing in the, the Dungowan Dam near Tamworth as well. Now, it's just such a shame, Mr President, we have in New South Wales a government that's working uh, with the federal government to build this infrastructure that people want in regional communities, while in Queensland we have a government with just as many opportunities, in fact perhaps more opportunities, to grow and develop their water resources while reducing the size of dams in Queensland. Right. The Paradise Dam, they've that's let right. over 100,000 megalitres, or they're going to let over 100,000 megalitres go and reduce the size of that dam, shrinking opportunities for farmers in the future. And on the Rookwood Weir, they're complaining that they can't afford it anymore, and now they're cutting the size of the Rookwood Weir as well, which will cut off future opportunities for farmers in central Queensland. We'll stand for dams, this government, because we believe in the future of farming in this nation. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline to the Senate how Queensland drought-affected farmers have responded to Labor's plan to downsize Rookwood Weir near Rockhampton, while these farmers suffer? Through extreme drought conditions. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I can, I can, Mr. President, respond to Senator McGrath's question because I've been talking to a lot of these affected farmers. I know the Minister for Agriculture came to, to Rockhampton recently to talk to them as well. Uh, in fact, around 200 farmers, landowners, graziers, concerned citizens of Rockhampton turned out on the streets a couple of weeks ago to complain about the Labor Party's decision to downsize Rook, Rook, Rookwood Weir. Now, including it was, uh, someone who was there was Larry Acton, a former yep. uh, head of the uh, head of Ag Force in, in Queensland. He said that my property is next to the Weir site, and I can tell you right now, not much has happened on the site for years. While Jackie Trad has announced that the public service would have given 1,250 bonus, that was the last straw. The Duranga cattle farmer Colin Dunn says, one minute you look as though you've got access to water, the next minute it's all gone, especially myself because I'm on the tail end of it, so where the weir gets lower, I don't get any. My time was wasted looking into it, my money spent on it was wasted, it was no benefit to me anymore, and that's because of all the shameful activities of the Queensland Government that have reduced opportunity, opportunities Order. for Mr Senator Dunn Canada, and others like Senator him. McGrath, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Liberal National Government put funding on the table for Rookwood Weir more than three years ago. What will the real Rookwood Weir, as proposed by the Liberal National Government and supported by the Liberal National Opposition in Queensland, mean for farmers in central Queensland? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, we know at length what this will provide uh, to the people of central Queensland because it's been talked about for so long. Back uh, uh, more than 10 years ago, the former Premier of Queensland, Peter Beattie, said he's going to build the Rookwood Weir. He's going to do it by 2011, and we're still waiting in central Queensland for it. Mr. President, we know from the studies that have been done from this that if we were to build 
the real Rookwood Weir. It would deliver 2,100 jobs. It would double agricultural production in the Fitzroy Basin, and it would massively expand the food opportunities for Rockhampton and Central Queensland. We're already the beef capital of Australia in Rockhampton. We'd like to be the food capital as well, but the Labor Party in Queensland are trying to deny that future to the people of central Queensland because they've run out of money. They don't prioritise uh, farmers in Queensland. In fact, today we learned that the Queensland government has enough money to spend $1.65 million on a virtual reality centre wow. for the Cross River Rail project, something that doesn't even exist while they won't build dams. Shame. Senator Shame. Chisholm. Thanks, uh, Mr. President. You built one for the Western Sydney Airport, exactly the same. Order. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Order. How many residential aged care facilities do not have a registered nurse on site 24 hours a day? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. It is true that not all aged care facilities have a Order. nurse on, to on site 24 hours a day. Uh, but it is actually not required by the quality and safety standards that uh, aged care facilities operate under. What the quality and safety standards require from aged care facilities is that they provide the quality of care at the level of safety uh, that's required by those standards and by the acuity of the patients that, and the residents that are in those facilities. So, Mr. President, there is no requirement under the Australian quality and safety standards for facilities to have nurses on site 24 hours a day. And, and so, Mr President, uh, the, the rationale for the question, uh, I suppose, stands to be questioned in that context. Uh, Mr President, aged care providers are required to provide the quality of care at the level of safety that represents the acuity of residents in the facilities. That's what the quality and safety standards say, and that's, what's the, that's what the government requires them to do. Order. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Yes, Mr President. How many aged care providers outsource all of their obligations to another service provider? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. Mr President, uh, there are a number of models of provision of care within the aged care sector in Australia. There are some providers who provide a uh, property-based uh, uh, operation, and then they subcontract their care to an, another approved provider. Uh, one of the poorer examples of what we've seen in this space was the situation at Earl Haven, Mr. President, where unfortunately the approved provider was subcontracting to a, another provider that had no uh, approval or accreditation at all, and we saw the very unfortunate outcome in that, in that circumstance. Uh, so, Mr President, there are a number of, number of models of provision of care within the aged care sector, uh, and, the, uh, the, of course, providers are required to meet the standards of care that's, that's uh, demonstrated and required under the aged care quality and safety standard. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Yes, Mr President, and I'm glad uh, the minister raised Earl Haven. Operations of the Earl Haven nursing home in Queensland were outsourced, and a subsequent dispute between the owner and operator resulted in a triple zero call to evacuate over 70 frail and elderly residents after most staff had fled. How many more senior Australians will suffer the same fate before the government finally acts on aged care regulations? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, the, the government introduced new quality and safety standards on the 1st of July this year. So, Senator Chisholm is well out of date in respect of the question that he asked. Can I say, Mr. President, Mr. President, what happened at Earl Haven? And, and I don't uh, disagree with anybody on that side of the chamber. What happened at Earl Haven Order. was an absolute disgrace. Was an absolute disgrace and should not have happened. Uh, and when we receive the report from uh, Kate Carnell later this month. Uh, we'll have some opportunity to reflect on what happened at Earl Haven and take some, act take some action to deal with anything, any issues that cropped up. But can I say, in the context of uh, Senator Chisholm's accusation that the staff fled, that is actually not true. 
That is actually not true. Order. One of the things that was good about what happened at Earlhaven was that the staff actually stayed to assist the residents. And I congratulate the staff on that. So to, to make that claim, I think, against the staff is quite outrageous because they are very good people. Order. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Oh, Senator Green. Yes, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to the questions asked by Senators Gallagher and Watt. Thank you. Uh, this week we have seen this government deflect, deny and attack Labor instead of listening to the concerns of everyday Australians who are hurting from higher bills and economic uncertainty. What we have seen is Liberal National Senators opposite behaving like an opposition, ranting and raving about Labor, they even managed to rant about Queensland Labor today, when they should be acting like a government, a third-term government getting on with a plan, but we know they have no plan. The RBA and the IMF have both called for Australia to invest in infrastructure to stimulate the economy and create more jobs. But instead of listening to those concerns, the government wants to talk about Labor and the economy continues to slide backwards. I thought I might take this opportunity to talk about youth unemployment and the figures that have been released today. We know it is fair to say that the Minister for Youth's performance this week has been pretty hopeless. And again today we've learned that youth unemployment rate has not changed. There's been no change to that figure and that should alarm everyone in this place. But really it is the performance of the Minister for Youth outside of this chamber that matters the most, because young people are struggling to pay their bills, to get the training and skills that they need, and facing higher rates of unemployment under this government. After six years, no plan, nothing but attacks on Labor instead. And today we learn that 28.2 per cent of 15 to 19-year-olds are underemployed—28.2 per cent unemployment, underemployment. Of people aged 20 to 24 years old, underemployment rate is 15.5 per cent. Now, those are shocking statistics and those are the national statistics, but I do want to raise the unemployment rates in regional Queensland because they're not getting much attention in this place from the other side. The other side are happy to ask questions about Queensland Labor. They're happy to point the finger I know they wish they probably were back in Queensland. It's a fantastic place to be, but they're not in the Parliament of Queensland asking questions of the Queensland Labor government. They are the government. They've been the government for six years, and it's time they start acting like it. In Townsville, the unemployment rate has gone from 5.8 per cent when Labor left office in 2013 to 8.3 per cent. And concerningly, under the Liberals, the medium job search time hit an extraordinary 34 weeks in October last year—34 weeks to find a job in Townsville last year—34 weeks on Newstart, waiting to find a job. And the story isn't much better for youth unemployment. Youth unemployment rate in Townsville, 15 to 24-year-olds, has gone from 8.9 per cent when Labor left office in 2013 to 17.1 per cent now under the Liberals. Youth unemployment rate in Townsville has almost doubled. And instead of getting adequate responses about how the government is going to deal with this, we get deflection and denial and attacks and more questions about Labor than answers about what the government is going to do to fix this problem. The issue is the same in Mackay. The medium job search time has gone from eight weeks when Labor was in office to 23 weeks now under the Liberals. It is almost tripled. When Labor left office, there were 5,000 people in Mackay looking for work. Now there are 6,500 people looking for work. An extra 1,500 people in Mackay without a job. Youth unemployment in Mackay, the Minister for Youth would like to write this one down, it's 15, for 15 to 24-year-olds has gone from 8.6 per cent 
to 15.5 per cent now under the Liberals. Older people have also been let down. The unemployment rate for persons aged 45 and above in Mackay has gone from 2.6 per cent to 5.6 per cent under the Liberals. So if you want to talk about Labor, why don't you talk about the unemployment rates when Labor was in office and what they are now under your government? But these statistics relate to real people living in regional Queensland. My plea to this government is not to ignore them. Stop attacking Labor. Start doing something to fix the problem. There's plenty of things that you could do to help young people in regional Queensland, and instead of doing any of them, instead of talking about them in this place, you're here attacking Labor every single day. Well, the jig is up and people are on to you. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, it is a great pleasure of mine to be able to stand here today and talk about uh, these great figures that have uh, come out today uh, that represent uh, significant um, uh, strength that's happening in the economy. There's no doubt some strong headwinds that this country is facing, but we are facing them uh, as a country very, very well. Over 14,500 jobs, in fact, were created uh, in the month of September, uh, and this is, represents a, an increase of 311,000 new jobs that have been created uh, this year. And this is off the back of a very strong and substantial plan that we're enacting as a government, a responsible government, a, a government that was elected by the Australian people to implement this plan, and it's what we're doing. We've seen employment grow at 2.5 per cent and remains well above the decade average. Uh, total employment is at a record high with almost 13 million people employed. This is a record high. Uh, we haven't seen it. It is unprecedented and it has happened under this government, under this Morrison government. Uh, we have seen, uh, Madam uh, um, Deputy President, uh, we have seen full time employment increase by 26,200 jobs over the month, with almost 9 million Australians in full time work. So these are full time jobs, and then have made, these make up 61.5 per cent of the total employment growth over the past year. The number of unemployed people fell by nearly 25,000 people over the month, with the underemployment rate falling by 0.2 per cent. This is outstanding. This is, uh, th this is happening in people's lives. These aren't just figures. We're talking about individuals that have been able to get ahead, they've been able to find work under a strong economy, an economy that is that is bolstered by good policies, that's growing the economy with, 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 the, with the, the decrease in, uh, in taxes. Uh, Australians are able to keep more of the money that they earn, the effective take-home pay that they are experiencing in their own lives and their, with their families, and their family income has increased under this government. We also heard the minister speak uh, when uh, Minister Cash which was answering her question uh, about the increase in number of women in employment. In fact, it's at a record high, a record high of over 6,110,000 women uh, are in work today, a record high, which is something that this side of the chamber and I and I'd hope uh, this entire chamber would be very, very proud that this is happening in our great country. Uh, uh, Senator Green spoke about youth unemployment, and uh, I, I, I find it interesting that uh, this, uh, those opposite would speak about this because there is an important program that is in existence in this country right now, and it's called Youth Jobs Path. That this. Uh, that side of the chamber do not support. Now, I just want to unpack for the, 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 the less than two minutes that I've got uh, left in this chamber this issue. If you are a young person unemployed looking for work, you, you knock on the door of all sorts of employers asking them to give you a job. But the reality is most employers will say back to them, we need people that have experience. They need to be able to get a foot in the door, but it's very difficult to get a foot in the door when, of course, employers are saying that that's what they need, that, that they need people with experience. Youth Jobs Path provides people that opportunity to be able to get in with an employer, to get an opportunity, to take up that opportunity uh, through an internship program. Yet those opposite voted against this program when it was first introduced, and they announced in the election that they would cut this program. Why would they do that? 
because they're beholden to the unions. Labor are beholden to the unions and they can't see the opportunity that can be created. I would encourage all members of this, uh, all senators here in this chamber, to, to promote this program. We've seen over 8,000 people go from welfare and into work through this program, and it's an opportunity for young people to be able to get ahead, to get off welfare and into work. We, we heard about the increase to New Start, and, the, and there's a, an argument for that, those that are making for that. Well, under this program, participants get an extra $200 a fortnight added to their New Start payment to assist them with the cost of getting the bus tickets, with the cost of filling up their cars or, 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 or buying the uniform that they'd need to be able to uh, keep, uh, get and keep that job. And this is what this government is doing. But those opposite won't uh, accept this because they're beholden to the unions and they can't see uh, the opportunities. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I also rise to take note of the answers uh, from, from earlier today. What we've heard is that the warnings for a long time are now worsening and the conditions in our economy are going backwards. There are many voices and uh, not any means from the fringes of debate. However, there are, there are voices that have come from right across our community. They've come from the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, from many business executives, from a lot of successful businesses here in Australia from state and territory governments and from all manners of various industry groups. But most importantly, they've come from ordinary Australians, working families who are finding it very, very tough and hard to make ends meet now than ever before. Madam Deputy President, earlier this week we heard the news from the International Monetary Fund that they were sharply downgrading the forecasts for our economy. In the IMF's view, Australia's economy is tipped to grow by just 1.7 per cent this year, down from the previous estimate of 2.8 per cent. Now, to put that into perspective, Australia's economy is predicted to grow at a rate smaller than that of Greece, a clear sign that the tax cuts that the government had insisted would provide a boost to the economy has actually not worked. Meanwhile, here in Canberra, we have a government that is asleep at the wheel. They would rather talk about the opposition than make the important decisions that are needed to get our economy moving again. Let me give advice to those opposite. Attacking Labor won't fix our economy, nor will it improve the wages and living standards of hard-working Australians. You need greater fiscal stimulus to tackle the collapsing confidence and weak economic growth. We know from the release of the household income and labour dynamics in Australia, the Hilda survey, just a few months ago, that under the Liberals, ordinary Australians have gone backwards. After six long years of economic mismanagement, real median household income is lower now than what it was back in 2013. Falling household incomes now mean that the percentage of our population living in relative poverty has increased to 10.4 per cent. In fact, in the last year of the survey, it was shown that the household income reduced by around $500. Now, that difference may not seem a lot for many of us in this place, but for a lot of Australians outside of the Canberra bubble, $500 is a lot and is a big hit to family budgets. It can mean the difference between sending the kids to school camp for the year or them having to stay home. It's the difference between being able to afford to have the heaters on over winter or staying cold. These are just a few examples of what the real-life impact is to work in families when our economy is floundering in the way it is at the moment. And to top it all off, in the time that this government has presided over one of the most significant slowdowns in decades, they have also presided over cuts to penalty rates and devastating low rates for New Start and other social security payments. Australians have a right to know what this government is doing to help them make ends meet. They have a right to know what the government is doing to lift their wages and address the weakness in our economy. Unfortunately, despite all these conditions, all of this struggle 
All we get from this government is a few not-so-snappy attack lines against Labor and let's wait and see. Australians who are doing it tougher now than they were ever before deserve more from this government. They deserve a government that is prepared to recognise the troubles ahead and to take actions to safeguard their welfare, as did Prime Minister Kevin Rudd and Labor did when the global financial crisis hit back in 2008. I'm sorry to say that this government is not doing that at all. They would rather attack Labor and, and, and then rather ensure that our nation's prosperity is secured for the future. Thank you, Senator Giacconi. Senator Scar. <clears throat> Madam Deputy President, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to take note of the answers earlier today in question time. And can I address some of the issues raised by Senator Ciccone? And he's an extremely decent uh, representative from the state of Victoria, and uh, I do admire his decency and integrity. However, uh, that doesn't excuse him for the uh, subject matter of his last contribution to the debate. The one thing I have learned while serving in this chamber is when the Labor Party actually refers to a document you need to go to the source document and see what the author actually said. Go to the source document and see what the author of the document actually said. And can I say in relation to the IMF report, this is what the IMF economic counsellor Gita Gopinath said in relation to the IMF's report. Growth continues to be weakened by rising trade barriers and increasing geopolitical tensions. Not by Australian government policy, but by rising trade barriers and increasing geopolitical tensions. The councillor goes on. We estimate that the US-China trade tensions will cumulatively reduce the level of global GDP, not just Australian GDP, global GDP, by 0.8 per cent by 2020. This is a global issue. A global issue not an Australian specific issue, but you would not know it. I am a detailed man, a de detailed and details man, uh, Senator Smith, my good friend from Western Australia. This is a global issue, but you would not know it. You would not know it from the Labor Party's contribution to this debate. And then uh, my, my colleague, Senator Ciccone, refers to Greece. Greece is a benchmark for Australia. Greece. I must, say, I must say you started to lose all credibility when you referred to Greece as the benchmark. The IMF report confirms the same IMF report that they've selectively quoted from, taken out of context. The IMF report confirms that the unemployment rate in Greece is 19.3 per cent. 19.3 per cent. That's the benchmark. That's the benchmark the opposition's referring to. That's nearly four times higher than the current unemployment rate in Australia. Since the GFC, the Greek economy, is 23 per cent smaller and the Australian economy is 33 per cent larger. 23 per cent smaller in Greece, 33 per cent larger in Australia. The IMF forecasts long-run growth in Australia to be three times higher than Greece. Three times higher in Greece. But that's the benchmark. That's the benchmark we get referred to from my uh, friend on the opposition benches. Gross government debt in Greece is 184 per cent of GDP. 184 per cent of GDP in Greece. And that's the reference point. That's the reference point we get from uh, my good friend Senator Ciccone. But let's move on to Senator Green, another decent senator sitting on the other side of this chamber. And Senator Green raises the question: why is it? Why is it that people on this side of the chamber, especially we Queensland senators, refer to the Queensland Labor government? And the problem is they're standing in the way of job creation. They are standing in the way of job creation. The people of Queensland are fed up, absolutely fed up and tired with the do-nothing Palaszczuk trad government. Senator Canavan, Minister Canavan referred to the Rookwood Weir. 2,100 jobs, 2,100 jobs in central Queensland that could be unleashed, could be unleashed 
in the economy in Queensland if the Queensland government simply took advantage of the opportunity presented to them, but they refuse to do so because they're a do-nothing government. A do-nothing government. Ackland Stage Three, New Hope's Ackland Stage Three. Ten years they've been seeking the approvals, and now they're having to lay off 150 workers. That's not creating new jobs. Those are existing jobs. Existing jobs having to be laid off because of the do-nothing Labor government. The reality of this matter is, Madam Deputy President, that the coalition government has a plan. Quiet Australians endorse that plan by providing a majority to the coalition government. And can I tell you, nowhere was the expression, was the expression of that support louder, louder than in regional Queensland, where they weren't just quiet Australians, they gave an almighty roar. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, attacking Labor won't create a single job or help wages growth. And the reality is that people are suffer suffering desperately. The lack of wages growth is having a major impact on people's lives, and yet this government refuses to act to stimulate the economy. The RBA, the IMF, state and territory government and businesses are calling for the Morrison government to stimulate the economy. We have seen the IMF and the OECD and the Reserve Bank and Deloitte Access Economics all downgrade Australia's expected growth. The IMF indicated that we're going to see an increase in the unemployment rate. And who do you think will feel this the most? It's the vulnerable. It's the unemployed. It's our young people in remote and regional Australia. First Nations people in remote communities with no jobs. A submission to the Community Affairs Committee into the adequacy of New Start and related payments from Dr Francis Markham and Professor John Altman at the ANU said, the simplest way to reduce poverty in remote Indigenous Australia is to raise the rate of New Start. It is not hyperbolic but merely a restatement of the epidemiological evidence to point out that the current rate of New Start is killing Indigenous Australians. Life expectancy gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians cannot be expected to close while the rate of New Start remains so low." End of quote. Yet what does this government do? They attack Labor rather than make any moves to boost the economy. This government refuses to raise the rate of New Start. And those on New Start and Youth Allowance experience poverty at the highest rates. The inadequacy of New Start is an economic issue as well as a welfare and wellbeing issue. New Start recipients are six times more likely to face poor health outcomes. They're more likely to suffer from multiple conditions. They're more likely to suffer from mental health. They're more likely to be hospitalised. Poor health is a barrier to work, and we all know this. People are struggling to afford the basics and the essentials, and they're struggling to meet their medical and health care costs. And what about CDP? CDP, not CDC, <coughs> but we'll get to that at some point, but CDP, the Community Development Program. The Work for the Dole program in Australia pays $11 an hour. The national minimum wage is $18.93 per hour. How can people be expected to look after their families? How can they afford groceries and power bills or put fuel in their vehicles? In September 2017, there were 32,600 CDP participants. 82.5 per cent of whom identified as Indigenous. We were told during the last term of government that this government, the Morrison government, would find 6,000 jobs for those 33,000 people. Mm. Big promises on jobs. Well, where are those jobs? 6,000 subsidised jobs were supposed to commence in February this year. It's October. 
That very quietly was downgraded to 1,000 jobs. And now, wait for it, wait for it. The Morrison government has gone very quietly and put out a package of just 100 subsidised jobs on CDP. 100, not the 6,000, not even the 1,000, but they've just quietly gone in and said, we'll give 100 jobs. 5,900 That's 100, precisely. That's 100 down from 6,000. That is quite a reduction in the employment opportunities that were meant to come. And where are the jobs? This government has no plan for our country. It has no plan to deal with low wages and rising prices, and the cost of essentials is skyrocketing, electricity prices are increasing, and childcare has become unaffordable under the Liberals. Australians are worried about the economy, but Scott Morrison and the Liberals are pretending there is no problem. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. So the question is: A motion is moved by Senator Green be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. You've got about 30 seconds, Senator oh. Faruqi. Um, I best. rise to take note of the response from Minister Cash to my question in the report entitled "Economic and Social Impacts of Recreational Hunting and Shooting." And this report is just another example of vested interests getting their way in this parliament. We have a chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Shooting, Minister Mackenzie, seemingly using health budget to fund her pet projects. How is this okay? This is absolutely disgraceful. I note that the senator is launching the Parliamentary Friends of Shooting next week, along with CIFA, and we all know about CIFA from the Four Corners expose. Thank you, Senator Fruki. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Fruki to take note, uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McKean.